There's all sorts of realms when one deals with messy, complicated problems that you need to think about in some wildly interacting way. We all have a strategy that we come up with. A strategy to make things easier, which is that we think in categories. We think in categories, we take things that are continua and we break them into categories and we label those categories. And we do that in various settings because it could be extremely useful. For example, somebody give me an estimate on how long this line is. A foot. Okay, people who said a foot, what is it that went through your head to figure it out? You imagined how long a ruler is. This is 11 and a half inches because it's, an eight and a, it's 11 inches and 8 and a half by 11. But everybody in here has this category in their head, things that are kind of the same length as a ruler a continua of lengths, and there's a category for that. Suppose I'm telling you I have some friend who's a runner, he runs the mile, he's incredibly fast. In fact, he's one of the best runners in the country at this point. How fast does he have to have run the mile or better for you to be deeply impressed? Under four minutes, and thus we have another categorical boundary there of there's an infinite variety of speeds with which you can run a mile, yet we have in our heads this boundary, people who are under four minute milers, you are very impressed with. Okay, now I want to impress you with another friend of mine who's a painter. And this person is such a great painter that they paint with 11 different colors. That doesn't work, because that's not a category that we have. We don't classify the quality of, or hopefully not, uh, we, we don't classify quality of paintings along those lines. But what we begin to see here is, in the right areas, we have categories that we impose on things that are not categorical. Here's an example. Why should you do this? Where did the example go? Here's one of the classic continua that we ever deal with, which is the continua of color, the varying wavelengths that take the rainbow from violet to red, and there's an infinite number of spaces in between. And what do we do? We have rules in English that you divide the continua here and here or whatever, and that's what you call a color. This is red, everything from here is red, everything here is orange, so on. You take a continua and you break it into boundaries. Why do we do that? Because it makes it easier to store the information away. Instead of remembering the absolute features of something, you simply say, it's A. It's a sub four minute miler. It's a line that's almost the length, that's about the length of a ruler. It's the color orange. How do you know that's the case? Because go and take people from other language groups where their language arbitrarily divides the rainbow at other points with completely different color terms, and they remember different profiles of colors differently than an English speaker might. Take a color, and if the color comes right in the center of somebody's color categorization, uh, it comes right in the middle of the range of what counts as that color, people remember whether they saw that color or not far better than if you show them a color at the boundary. And people will show that as a function of what language they speak. Taking a continua and you break it into pieces because it's easier to deal with the facts. Another example of it, here we have four objects and as drawn here, simply because we have categories to describe the first three, do one of those tests of show people a bunch of shapes and they come back an hour later and ask them, have you seen the shape before? And people are going to be far more accurate with this than whether they saw this or not because we don't have a word for it. We don't have a word that's at all sort of analytical, that's some squiggly whatever. We don't have a clear-cut category. Thinking in categories makes it easier for us to remember stuff. And it makes it easier for us to evaluate stuff. So that's a classic sort of response that we have cognitively to complicated things. But there's a bunch of problems with categorical thinking. First example. And first one you can see from a realm of language differences in that not only is there a continua of infinite number of wavelengths, there's a continua of sounds that humans can make. 
and different languages draw boundaries at different points as to what count as similar sounds or different sounds. There's like two different TH sounds in English, which apparently we're not very good at hearing, but there's other ones we are. And that will affect your ability to remember stuff, what word it was, depending on whether it is on a dramatically different boundary, whether it is sound that sounds different to you or not. Example of this. Apparently, in Finnish, people do not differentiate between the sound of a B and the sound of a P, whereas we have no trouble with that. But people from Finland do not make that differentiation. And I discovered this one day a number of years ago, where for reasons I don't even understand, I found myself needing to take testicular biopsies on baboons. Not having sort of learned that in junior high, how you do that, I called up this guy at urology at the med school who happened to be Finnish, and I explained to him what I wanted to do, and he sort of took me through the paces and told me what thingy I needed to buy and that sort of stuff and holiday packages of those where you can get a dozen, and sort of telling me how to do that. And once we went through, he said, what I want you to do, the thing to do at this point, is get some practice. I want you to practice on a bear. What? He said, yeah, practice on a bear. And I said, are you kidding me? He said, I know, I know it sounds crazy, but we have all the residents do that. It's a very good learning device. You know, either, either practice on a bear or an apple. Here we see the dangers of making mistakes about differences between B and P under certain circumstances. So we see one of the dangers there, which is when you are paying too much attention to categories, you can't differentiate two facts that fall within the same category. Next example. Remember back at various points of anxiety during exams and such back when, where there was a world of difference between getting a 65 on a test and a 66 on a test. Not particularly different, but because there's this boundary drawn there between passing and failing, there is this dramatic differentiating we make. When you put a boundaries, you have trouble seeing how similar things are on either side of it. Next example, one additional problem that you get when you think categorically. And for this, everybody needs to turn over one of the pieces of paper, the paper you're going to hand in, the questionnaire. And what I'm going to do is read you a series of phone numbers, and I want you to write them down as accurately as possible. OK, ready. 243-2649. 650-3262. 650-3262. 832 2 9132449 2913171 2314026593242674388840 Okay, now what that exercise is, and no, that doesn't count towards the grade. What that will show, I'm sure, when in some obsessive burst of procrastination, I actually look through the answers tonight, what it's going to show is the accuracy is going to tank the second you go from the phone number pattern of three digits followed by four, break up that pattern, and suddenly we all get screwed up because we're saying, wait a second, I thought it was a phone number. That was one digit. Now two digits. I can't. And it's gone, and you're on to the next one. And what we see there is the third example, which is when you pay too much attention to boundaries, you don't see the big picture. All you see are categories. All you see are, wait a second, phone numbers are supposed to come with three digits followed by four. Another example of where we use categorical thinking. OK, I'm putting up a number series here. <coughs> Okay, what's, oh my god. Okay, what's the next number in this series? And why? 42. How come? Okay, so we're kind of oscillating all over the place there. Okay, so. That's as valid as anybody else's. Who else has an X number in line there? What's that? 45. How come? Uh, 
Okay. Are you going to take that? <laughs> 45. That's very... Okay, what else? Let me make it a little bit easier here. Okay, so what's the next number in that series? And what I'm telling you is if you think about the world with a certain set of categories in your head, you will know the next number in the sequence. So what's the next one? Seven billion. Seven billion. Okay, that one. Okay, seven billion, that's another possibility. Although presumably it would be seven billionth. Anything else? Any other guesses here as to what? happens next? 4th, 14th, 23rd, 34th. What's the next one in the sequence? Yes? 44. 44. How come? Uh, well, it's looking like you're just kind of going up like plus 10 in the tens column, but then when you're doing two fourths, or, and then the third number will be up first. <laughs> okay, but remember, it's got to be 44th. What's that? Ordinal? Cardinal? Whatever it is. What? 42nd. How come? You are right! You are right! Anybody who is a New Yorker <laughs> will know what the next one is. These are the subway stops. And you get a bagel with cream cheese. Can you pass it back? Just head it on back. Yay! So you get New Yorkers, and while everybody else is thinking logical things like 43 and 41 and 45 and 7 billion and all of that, you've got this whole world of dividing numbers by subway stops. We think in categories. We think in categories, but as you just saw, there are these problems. First one being, when you think in categories, you underestimate how different two facts are when they fall in the same category. When you think in categories, you overestimate how different they are when there happens to be a boundary in between them. And when you pay attention to categorical boundaries, you don't see big pictures. Now, what our goal in this class is going to be is think about this big, complex issue of the biology of behavior without falling into thinking in categories. What do I mean in this regard, thinking categorically about a subject like this? There's some chicken and the chicken is standing somewhere and there's some rooster over there that does some sexually solicited exciting thing for the female and in response to that the female picks up and goes running over to the rooster and thus we have our first behavioral biology question here why did that chicken cross the road to get to that rooster. So you could answer that like an endocrinologist and say, well, the female had certain levels of estrogen in her bloodstream, which made this key hypothalamic areas responsive to the stimulus. Or you could answer it like an anatomist of saying, well, because the fulcrum of her pelvis or whatever it is chickens have that allow them to run. Or you could answer it in the category of an evolutionary biologist that over the millennia, chickens that didn't respond to sexually solicitive gestures from males left fewer copies of their genes, and there's all these different categories that we can use to explain what's going on. All of these different buckets. All of these different buckets which begin to pull you towards all of the problems we just saw. Having trouble telling how different or similar two facts are, having trouble seeing big pictures, overemphasizing the importance of the bucket you happen to live inside of. And thus, suddenly, Everything about this behavior is explained by a gene, a neurotransmitter, a childhood trauma, a, a living inside one bucket. 